I started out at five. I think the first thing I went to was a football game with my uncle. He came to us like senior year, and he says, I don't think I want to play football in college. And we're like, okay. We were shocked. Both of us looked at each other, but we were shocked because that's all he ever talked about. I would say my love for sports was half split between my dad and his love for sports and my uncle and his love for Michigan State. He always used to joke us because he used to always tell his uncle because his uncles had season tickets ever since he graduated from there. And he's always to tell him, I'll get you lower bowl tickets. I'll get you lower bowl tickets. You'll get in the lower bowl, Uncle Mike. Don't worry. And we always say, yeah, okay, right, Kenny, right, you know. When I was 12, my dad asked me what I wanted my room to be, and I would instantly said Michigan State. And as a kid, I never dreamed of making it big in the NBA or NFL. I was always, I want to grow up. I want to be a Spartan. I want to play basketball at Michigan State. I want to play football at Michigan State. What if something happened? What if something happened to someone you loved? Someone that cared for you, loved you, and by all means was your everything. What would you say? What could you say? What would you do if it was your mother? In a matter of moments, life can change forever. In the time it takes for a pen to drop, a tear to be shed, and a basket to fall, lives can be altered, and the course of one family's life forever changed. My family, just my uh, nuclear, it's my dad, my mom, my sister. Uh, me and my sister are like best friends. My dad really has been my rock through everything we've gone through, and uh, which is crazy because I grew up a mama's boy, and I won't be afraid to admit it at all. Uh, growing up, me and my mom were as close as you can get from between a child and their parent. Uh, just because my dad worked nights all through uh, preschool, elementary school. When we think about it, back at it, most of the people that have the same health issues that you have, they don't live. So we're blessed. You know, you, you, you hate that it happened, but you're blessed that you're still alive. she's still alive. You know, because about 98% of the people have, have what she had happened to her, they don't live. Because I was sitting down there and she starts saying, and you know, if you're married, you know how when your wife says, I got a headache, you go and say, go lay down, you'll be all right. You go, you'll be all right. Take some aspirin, go lay down, you know. And I told her, I said, for some reason, I was laying on the couch and I got up and came up here. She got up from this kitchen table and went in there and laid on the couch. And by the time she sat on the couch in the other room, she couldn't see. In 2006, Kenny's mom, Laura, suffered from an arterial valve malformation, a condition around her spinal cord that, in her case, caused an excessive buildup of fluid in the brain, requiring immediate surgery to relieve the pressure and prevent further damage. Just to hear that you may never see your mom again, it was just traumatizing, really. So I got sent home that night. Um, I don't think I slept one second that night. Just as early as my dad and my sister were ready to go, we went to go see her, and at that point she was still in ICU, but uh, they still said that I think it was less than 50% chance that she would um, ever be able to walk again or even leave the hospital. I'd have to go sit there in the hospital and like try and talk to my mom, uh, usually who couldn't respond at this point. Uh, and uh, I, I spent my uh, my birthday in the hospital with her, and it's hard because for the, those next three months, she literally was hooked up to it. It looked as if she was like half bionic the way uh, I would go see her because she would she wouldn't be able to move the bed, move from the bed, and she would just have wires all connected to her brain because they were trying to figure out. Uh, where it was disconnected at in the brain stem and whatnot and try and figure out ways to fix it. Uh, her entire head was just completely shaved. It's like she didn't even look like the same person, you know? And it just, that's another thing, seeing someone that close to you in that, in that stage of physical being, it, it just never will ever leave my mind.
sorry. I think the first time I heard my mom uh, really talk after her surgery was on my parents' anniversary. We came in and uh, the nurses and my aunt had set it up to uh, surprise my dad. And um, they said happy anniversary. And then that was like the first thing I heard my mom say to my dad, really. Uh, and that was like uh, the beginning of a long road to her recovery, which she still isn't fully recovered. But it, it was crazy how one night, um, it just, everything flipped. And just nothing was ever the same. When that happened to my sister, um, we did try to keep their lives, Kenny and Caitlin's life, the same, not having to watch your mom, but those children, both of them stepped up and because she needed constant care and then Ken had to go to work and um, we helped out as much as we could, but they just kind of did what they had to do. Like her speech, she gets better and then, you know, sometimes it gets worse, you know. Uh, she has to keep walking, working on her walking. She has double vision still that she, that's never gonna go away. You know, so there's things that, you know, you have to deal with, you know. It's a huge event in their life, you know. But I think in the long run it'll help them because they understand how fragile life is. Because they didn't know what was going to come out of that. And here we are, what? That's what, nine years ago? Yeah. Eight. Yeah, nine going on ten, Lord, because it was 2006 when you had all your health issues. I mean, you know, things have changed, you know. Hey, look at it. We got a 21-year-old and a 19-year-old now, so <laughs> things have changed tremendously. As the Goins adjusted to their new reality, Ken began working multiple jobs to help support the family, a large factor that would affect Kenny's own future. I, I had been talking to my parents about college for quite a few years now. Uh, I would probably say since end of my sophomore year because my sister, two years older than me, was going to college at that time. So they kind of just brought it up to me like, hey, what are you, what are you thinking right now? And uh, at that point I was like, I want to go play basketball somewhere. Um, that's all I had said. Didn't have any scholarship offers. Really wasn't talking to any coaches even. Despite a successful high school basketball career at Warren Moss, recruiters didn't start heavily pursuing Kenny until his senior year after a successful AAU season. In a matter of months, offers quickly transitioned from Division III schools and the Ivy League to Division II and eventually a Division I full-ride offer from Central Michigan University. I narrowed it down to the Central Michigan, Michigan State, and Michigan State being a walk-on, so I was either gonna take the scholarship at Central or walk on here and pay. So it kind of flip-flopped just because of my love for Michigan State that I would be willing to do these financial risks and play basketball uh, just because of the like, university. When he had got the offer to be a walk-on, it was the hardest thing for him because he thought me and mom would be angry if he didn't take one of the scholarships. And I told him, I says, well, I had to sit down and talk to him. Me and her, I told her, I says, if you weren't going to play sports, and you wanted to go to college, just go to college. Where do you want to go to school? He says, Michigan State. I says, well, that's your answer. And I told every every recruiter that talked to me, I told them and I, I would sit there and listen to what they said to me and I told them, I says, it's his decision. And I says, I can tell you right now, I says, if Michigan State ever calls him or says anything to him, you guys are done. And they, they thought I was joking. A lot of them thought I was joking when I told them this and I was like, I'm totally serious. And they says, really? They said, even if they told him they weren't gonna get, I says, any kind of talk from Michigan State. Kenny is done talking to you guys. Kenny Goins has had a little bit of a tougher upbringing with, a, you know, his mother's gone through some illnesses, and uh, but aunt and uncle used to bring him up here, and uh, he just had a passion and a love for the place. But I know that uh, he had offers from other schools, uh, a little bit smaller level, and uh, usually you don't get a kid like that to walk on, and uh, Kenny was a guy, he, scored very high in his ACT, a very intelligent kid that uh, had a dream. And I guess uh, anytime a kid has a dream, I think of myself coming to a place like this with a one in a million chance to be the head coach. And I think I look at him as he had the same uh, objective when he came here to try to become a player at this level. And he's starting to do that. 
Kenny redshirted in his first season at MSU, but still traveled with the team to experience the rigors of a Big Ten schedule and a trip to the Final Four. After the team's trip to Italy over the summer, Coach Izzo informed Kenny that he had earned a scholarship for the 2015-16 season. I think he came in and they told him, you need to have a chip on your shoulder and earn it. And he said, I will. When he called me, I was at work and told me he got the scholarship. It was just tears, I mean. And then he called you, I think, at home that night. And unbelievable. The kid has, has achieved everything he has set for himself. So nobody's worked to give him that scholarship but him. You know, certainly took a risk doing that because there was no guarantee, that's for sure, and still isn't. Yeah, but, you know, he, I think he went with his heart. Well, Kenny's had a, even a rough year uh, so far. You know, he had a sports hernia, and uh, this summer it took care of a lot of his ability to gain weight and lift hard, and um, so the process has been a little slow. Then he has that big 13 rebound game against Louisville. Probably don't beat him without him and he breaks his nose towards the end of that game. So it's been kind of uh, like the rest of us, there's, it's just been a strange year with strange injuries, and yet uh, he's battling through it. I think if he gets a good spring, summer, and fall, he could take being a good player and maybe take being a, a great player. He has tremendous athletic ability, um, long arms, uh, great body for a forward in this league, and. Uh, and a high IQ. So you put all those things together and uh, you know there's no ceiling to where he can go in in respect to uh, his basketball career. Parents always strived for an education over athletics just because they know one day I can end up with an, a career-ending injury when my brain for the most part um, there's not a lot of things that you can take away up here. So I really have set my goals that I want to graduate on time with a degree in marketing and just to get ready for my future. That's, that's my main goal for college is just to prepare for the rest of my life. Through great adversity, Kenny reached his childhood dream of playing for Michigan State, but he's still looking to set even more goals for himself with a new dream the dream to give back to his family who have supported him every step of the way. Deontay Davis to jump it against Michael Jacobson, and off we go. Michigan State trying to avoid its first three-game conference losing streak in three years. The cutter is Valentine, and that's how the night starts. Watson has a jump shot for a long, no, it's a three ball, he got it. Darn, all of a sudden it's Nebraska 20, and Michigan State's got 14. for a three ball, he got it! Michigan State 45, Nebraska 41. Shields got the roll. He is feeling it right now. Valentine again. How about that execution? He gives it over to Watson, give and go down low to Webster. Nothing, but he goes in the side for wide open three balls up and it's in. They go Davis against Jacobson. Deontay Davis with an off fake, fades in. Yes. Yes. That's a super soft touch. Tough shot too. Back to Valentine, mismatch against Jacobson. Aaron Harris, long three, go! running out of time. Valentine throws it up. Are you kidding me? It's a three in a one-point game. 
Here comes the shot. It's no good. Rebound Valentine. Three seconds. Here he comes. He goes down the lane. He stops. He pops off the rim. And we lose another one by one point. Last weekend, College Game Day visited East Lansing for the fourth time and was the Spartans' eighth time overall on the show. No other Big Ten program has appeared on the show more than Michigan State. The Midwest has missed all of the weather problems, and they're hoping that things heat up and send the Spartans back closer to a return trip to the Final Four as the big green and white flag goes racing by. Glad to have you with us on College Game Day. Reese Davis, Jay Williams, Seth Greenberg, and Jay Bill is here. You know, it is 50 days until Selection Sunday, and that is no bull. When people outside look at your program and look at the games that are going to be played, look at the atmosphere, look at the arena they're in, there's a lot of things that go into game day. Having two great teams is a big part of it, but there's so much more. Game day is just a great experience. I mean, for me, it's the closest thing I get to coaching again in terms of walking into the arena and the energy, the passion. Our crew, uh, they work tirelessly. Uh, they get out here three to four days before our broadcast even starts, getting all the equipment in, us doing sports center hits throughout the entire, you know, two days before the game actually goes. Uh, you know, the rundown about what we're going to talk about, you know, what, what conversations we're going, we're going to highlight. Uh, the entire gambit of college basketball, how we're all going to fit that into an hour show. It's been nothing but fun for us because it's one thing to sit in the studio and talk about basketball. I mean, I love that. But when you're actually on site and you can feel like the game, um, it's one thing to watch the game. It's another game when you feel it. And game day helps, helps us feel it. We hope it helps the fans feel it. Uh, we think it does. When I think of the Breslin Center, when I think of the Izzone, when I think of what Tom and has been able to build here, uh, I thought what a great place to start our, our real season. Uh, uh, there's so much, there's great ownership uh, in this program here at Michigan State. And, uh, the Breslin Center is, is, a, is one of those iconic arenas right now that you want to experience. And coming to a place like Michigan State where, you know, game day has never been anywhere as much as it's been to Michigan State, football and basketball combined. And there's a reason for that. One, it's Michigan State's really good in football and basketball. And also the fans are so good. We, we, it's built that we know the atmosphere is going to be great here, and, and it always delivers. I just have to say this. If Michigan State is going to, if Michigan State is going to snap its three-game losing streak, they're going to have to perform a little bit better than you just did. <laughs> they need a little magic. They need a little bit more magic. Let's take a look at the reveal again. Oh, what a horrible job. We don't even have a state show. It's week one. It's week one. <laughs> Week one, he's picking Michigan State, Michigan State, Maryland, hoping they can get another win here in the Breslin Center. We've had a lot of talk here about losing streaks. We've had a lot of talk about the missed shot here or there. But at the end of the day, this game is not about any of that. It's not about a Big Ten Conference race. It's not about winning or losing games in a row. What it's about, it's about measuring up tonight. It's about being a competitor. And it's about regaining some of your swagger. So tonight on the big stage, it's Michigan State and it's Maryland. And MSU's single focus now is not about anything other than reclaiming its rightful place at the top of the college basketball world. Valentine Craig is at 5-4. More than two minutes in and still no points. Forbes out being guarded by Jake Lehman. That's some size on the smaller shooter. Valentine scoops it up and in. On the side and around the horn it goes. Costello gets the top of the key. Gets it back now to Valentine. Down to Matt. Matt's making a move. Is he going to make a move? He does. Oh, he goes left. He goes right. He goes left and he banks it in. Great look inside and then Goins, maybe the extra pass that they didn't need. It'll work out in their favor and a chance for three as Goins slams it home. Maryland shooting only 30% so far. The MSU defense has been so far so good. Kimball tries to go down on not going. Elvis has it, gets it to Valentine, goes all the way, lays it up, and it's in. Well, Tremble tried to split the defenders, and he dribbled it right into a Michigan State basketball shoe. Great defense there by Elvis. And how about 
Valentine with a 50 foot pass to Costello to answer. This is a different Michigan State team than we saw against Nebraska. Trimble, the assist to Lehman. A big shot for Maryland. They're back within five. They've been tied twice, but MSU's never not left. Aaron Harris has it out front. Now gets it off to Valentine for three, coming off a pitch. He got it. Oh, you got to love that answer by Valentine. He's got 10. Get a quick shot here. You can essentially go two for one if you're Michigan State, which not a lot of college teams do. Michigan State does, and Ford still has that look in his eye. Slap of the floor on D. Forbes gets a little bit of space, and he answers with a three of his own, his third of the game. How about the way Bryn Forbes is moving without the ball? Now, I think part of the reason he wasn't shooting the ball well was he wasn't getting good shots. If he's having any fun, you see the smile on his face going back down on deep. Ten on the shot clock, so it goes back to Castell with the block. Now to Forbes, off the pitch for three, off the back of him, no rebound, Davis, up, and it is no good. Tip though by Harris is good. Nice work by the guard, Harris. Trimble, he's been shooting the three all night long. This is this one. Long rebound down to Valentine. Numbers for Michigan State. Nice pass. Open is Forbes. Counter. Oh. Brent Forbes has 21 of Michigan State's 45 points. All set up by Denzel Valentine in transition. 10.52 left in this one. Valentine to Goins, now outside. McQuaid wide open for a three ball, he got it! How about that? Matt McQuaid got his back on top by two. Wait, nice block by Tchaikovsky. Valentine switches hands and has a chance for three. And Carter has it, he wrestles it from Valentine. He's having all kinds of troubles. And gives it to Raymond going down the baseline. What a block by Costello. Here comes Michigan State. Another jumper for Forbes who's having himself a night. Trimble has it. Top of the key, here comes the three ball. Nothing but net by Mellow Trimble. Man, he's got 22. Spartans have made 10 straight free throws. Costello again. All right, put him up there for right, best yeah. actor. Get rid of supporting. That star's making the speech, yeah. baby. <laughs> he is making the speech. What a night. 17.4 seconds. You knock down a three here or just get any score. And you got some pressure. Wayman bobbles, recovers, misses with the left hand. Costello, who else, with a rebound. Michigan State pulls away late. They win a hard-fought game, snap their three-game losing streak, and get back to the 500 mark in conference play. 17 and four overall. Maryland drops to six and two in lead play. Costello, 15 points, 12 rebounds, three blocks. Friend, where the bounce back? Number one Matt. hockey star goes to Matt Costello. Yeah. Yeah.